Well, in addition to what Nick just said, I am also somebody who stole a wizard hat from one of the organizers. So if you want to get your hands on one to borrow later, maybe you can talk to me. Now, who are you? Are you a well-defined constant, unchanging because you're confident that you know the right way to do things? Are you an undefined variable, still trying to figure out exactly who you are and what you value? Let me tell you a story. Once upon a time, there was a little girl who loved mathematics. Unlike our previous speaker, she continued to love mathematics and was intrigued by all of the different things that you could do with numbers, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. And as she grew a bit older, she found that what she really loved was not numbers themselves, but the ability to use these numbers to solve interesting problems. This fascination led her one summer to the nerdiest summer camp imaginable, a mathematics camp at which she learned about a new field of study, cryptography. And cryptography fascinated her because she saw how you could take a message and encode it and pass it to someone else without someone in the middle figuring out what was going on. But what fascinated her even more than this ability to keep messages secret was the potential for computers to uncover the secrets behind these messages. At the camp, she and her fellow attendees explored ways the computers could do things like perform letter frequency analysis on simple substitution ciphers to discover what the original message might have been. And this was her first exposure to the power of computers to do things beyond what a person could do alone. And this fascinated her. So when she had the opportunity to take a computer programming course her senior year of high school, she seized on it, and she was not disappointed. She saw the power of computers. She saw that she could make a computer do whatever she wanted. And if it didn't turn out quite right, she could tweak the code and immediately see the outcome. So when she went off to college, she decided to combine that original love of math with her love of computer science and major in both. Though as she took more classes, she came to realize that if she were to rank these majors in order of preference, computer science would certainly come out ahead. Yes. <laughs> she learned about different programming languages. She learned about algorithms and data structures and all these ways that you could use computers to solve interesting problems. When she graduated, she was ready to face the world with this knowledge and to write clever code to solve interesting problems. As you've probably all guessed, this is a story about me, about how I came to be a computer programmer. And I tell you this story to challenge you to reflect on your own story, how you got interested in programming. Whether you are a student, a professional programmer, or a hobbyist, I'm certain that each of us here today has a story about how we got interested in programming. And those stories, shape us and make us who we are, and they influence the preferences that we have. And those preferences are not just general life preferences, but they can be preferences reflected in our code as well. As an example of this, do you prefer a story that has nested layers a la Inception? Or do you prefer a story that finds a formula that works and continues to iterate on that same idea? In the realm of programming, do you prefer recursion, methods that call back to themselves to solve a problem, or iteration, using loops to solve that same problem? Both of these code examples are equally valid ways to find the prime factors of a number. But I'm guessing that we have different approaches that we prefer to solve this problem. Some might prefer loops, and some might prefer if statements with callbacks to the originally calling function, as you do with recursion. So who, who prefers recursion? Anyone? There's a few. And who prefers iteration? 
and lots of people didn't vote, that's okay, maybe you have some other third preference. <laughs> Let's look at another example. Do you prefer code that is action focused, that shows you what's happening one event after another, or code that is more descriptive, that paints a picture and explains the why behind what's happening? In other words, do you find more appeal in unit tests that focus on just the inputs and outputs of the code? Or would you rather see longer descriptions of why you're testing these different inputs and outputs? Anyone willing to admit to their preferences here? Action-focused inputs and outputs? A few hands. The more descriptive approach? Oh, more hands for that. But there were people who had each preference. And finally, would you rather see everything at once or broken up into installments? Do you prefer solving a relatively simple algorithm in a single method, or would you rather see it broken up into several small sub-methods? None of these code examples are right or wrong. They're all valid ways to solve problems. And we each have our preferences and our own styles reflected in the way we write code. Knowing your preferences is important because it can help you seek out those projects and opportunities that will bring you the most joy. And you can explore the things that, that you will enjoy and the ways that you prefer to write your code. If you stop there, though, if you stop just with knowing your preferences and always using those preferences, your code becomes a personal journal. And that can be powerful for some of your coding. It's an opportunity to, again, explore who you are, what you find compelling about programming, and to embrace your preference and your way of doing things. But if you always write your code that way, then you're missing out on a whole new opportunity. Because if you take your knowledge of your own preferences and combine it with your knowledge of the preferences of those sitting around you, and you apply that overall knowledge to your code, then you can become a storyteller, someone who tells a compelling narrative with your code, somebody who writes code in a way that others will read and understand and want to contribute back to. And that gives you power to let your code live beyond you, outside of your sole control, so that others can use it in their projects and contribute back to it. Your code can have a life of its own and it can live on even after you're done working on it. So I hope you can see the power of this, the power of becoming a storyteller, of telling a compelling story that others will understand and want to read with your code. So how do you go about doing that? The first step is to identify your purpose. Why are you writing this code? It could simply be that your boss at work told you to. So you're developing a specific feature that will serve your company. You might be seeking to write an open source library that lots of different developers will use. You might be aiming to create a finished product, an application, or a game. Whatever your purpose is, know what it is going in so that you can make sure your code is accomplishing that. And then ask yourself who is going to care about this purpose and who is going to want to read your code. That's your audience not the end users of the final product, but the people who will actually read and potentially contribute back to your code. In the workplace example, this could be your team member, coworkers, maybe a maintenance team who will take the code over long term. In that scenario, you want to write code that meets with your company's standards, that uses those code generators and start points that we heard about earlier, and you might be compelled to use terms that are specific to your industry, and that's okay because your audience will understand them. On the other hand, if you're writing for an open source community, you'll want to be more general in your terminology. And ask yourself additional questions too. Are these members of your audience newer to JavaScript? If so, you might want to provide some additional documentation to support your code. Are they native English speakers? If not, you might want to put a little more thought into your variable names and method names. Make sure you're using language and terminology that others from other countries will understand. 
whoever your audience is, make sure you identify them and then keep them in mind as you're coding so that you'll end up with code that will be compelling to them. Ask yourself if this will make sense to your audience. Now that can seem a bit overwhelming to always have to be thinking about other people and maybe you don't know what they would prefer. Well, the good news is that you don't have to do this alone. You can actually bring in potential members of your audience to help you. Just like authors have editors and co-authors for their stories, we can engage in code reviews and pair programming for the story of our code. So code reviews are really valuable because you can get feedback from other members of your audience or the code that you've written. At Union Pacific, where I work, we use a tool called Crucible to accomplish this. When I make a change to the code base, I'm able to log in to Crucible, indicate the changes that I've made, and then assign people to review the code. They can then go and log in and comment on that code in line. They can click in the line of code that they want to comment on and give me suggestions or ask questions. And this starts a dialogue because then I can respond back I can either simply accept their recommendation and make changes to the code, or we can have an ongoing conversation. And this has been wildly helpful to me at my job. I've been able to ask other team members questions that led to more clear variable names. I've been able to help get rid of some of those nested for loops by suggesting that they be replaced with filter methods. And I've gotten feedback, too, that has helped me to restructure and reorganize my code in a more intuitive manner. And Crucible is great for doing all of this. If you have a small team of five or fewer people, it's only $10 to get started. The price goes up pretty quickly when you have a larger team, so you might want to look into some other free alternatives. For example, GitHub has code reviews built in. So if you publish your code out on GitHub for the community to use and contribute to, you can create code reviews there. And when there are pull requests that come in, you can create code reviews from those as well. Or if the GitHub code review option doesn't quite meet your needs, you can find other free tools. One that I recently ran across was Codebrag, which even lets you like other people's comments to show that you agree with that comment. So code reviews are fantastic for getting that feedback on your code after you've written it. But there's one thing you can do that I think is even more powerful than getting that feedback after the code is written, and that's getting feedback as you're writing the code. That's where pair programming comes in. You can bring in a potential member of your audience and have them sit beside you as you work on the code together. Maybe you type and they comment on what you're doing and what they think about it, or they type and you give your input, or you take turns typing. The whole idea behind pair programming is that you're communicating and working together to come up with a better story in your code. And this has been invaluable to me at my workplace as well. I've been able to use pair programming to sit with someone who hasn't written a lot of tests in JavaScript before and show them how JavaScript code can be made testable. I've been able to explore new approaches to doing things and I've challenged others and myself to approach problems in different ways. Just a few weeks ago, I invited a coworker to come and pair with me on solving a specific problem. Being who I am with my mathematical problem-solving background, I was very focused on solving the problem at hand. I just wanted to get it done. But my coworker challenged me to take a step back to look at my code overall and find ways that I could improve it to make it more readable. He suggested that I extract out some methods, give them meaningful names, and allow the code to flow more like a story. At first, I resisted because I just wanted to get the task done. But when I took the time to listen to him, I realized that he was right, and I did have this opportunity to make my code better. So we worked on it together, and the final product was something that accomplished the task at hand and was more understandable for people who would need to read and maintain that code long term. And that's the power of treating your code like a story and getting this editorial feedback and collaboration going. It's all about that feedback and collaboration. And that won't always be easy. There will definitely be times when you hear something you weren't expecting or that you didn't really like to hear. 
authors experience this too. They get comments from their editor that they don't agree with or that they don't like. Nobody wants to be told that there's a better way to be doing what they already thought was great. But it's going to happen, and how you react to that is critical to the success of your story. I've definitely had that experience where I shared some code with my team that I thought was absolutely brilliant, only to find that they had no idea what this code was doing. They couldn't follow it. It wasn't readable. My initial thought was to tell them to suck it up and figure out how to understand my way of doing things. But that would not have been the best approach for my audience. So I worked with them to refactor the code and make it more understandable for them. But I didn't sacrifice my style entirely. I found a way to work with them to come up with a more compelling narrative. So sometimes you will have to change your code to make it better for your audience. But other times you can use their difference in opinion as an opportunity to teach them something new. For example, now that we all know how awesome thinking about JavaScript as functional programming is, we can go and share that with our teams who might not be familiar with that idea. For me, I've experienced this opportunity with coworkers who are coming from a Java background and don't understand arrow functions. So rather than avoiding arrow functions entirely in my code base, I teach them about arrow functions, how they work, how they cut down on clutter in the code, and how they ultimately make the code more readable. So in that example, my community of developers around me can embrace this new way of thinking, and the code is made better for everyone. So if you were one of those few people who really love recursion, surrounded by a sea of people who prefer iteration, maybe take the time to talk to somebody about why you like recursion, what is so compelling about it to you. And if that person comes around to your way of thinking, then great, there's more recursion in the world and you can be happy. But if not, maybe you want to take a step back and consider that you might have to write your code in a way that is slightly different from what you would normally prefer. You just might find in some situations that the differences between different approaches are not as different as you originally thought. For instance, between the option for writing an algorithm as one method and writing it as five, there's an option to write it as two methods, something that is concise and yet descriptive. And that might seem obvious. It might seem like an obvious middle ground that both sides can agree to. But when you stay laser focused on your way of thinking, when you think about your code as your personal journal instead of as a story, it's easy to miss those obvious compromises. So that's the power of getting this collaboration and feedback is that you can come up with a better, more compelling story that everyone who's in your audience, or at least most of the people who are in your audience, can enjoy and find engaging. You also have the power through this collaboration to take your project from that personal journal, that personal side project, to something that thousands of developers use all around the world that's known in many different companies and many different IT departments and that hundreds of people are contributing to. And that community aspect of your story will only make it better. Let me tell you one more personal story. I wanted to create a way for my team to keep track of the different projects we were working on and different metrics about them. Things like code coverage, defects, monitoring status. I originally thought of displaying this in a grid, and then I thought, why not use Excel? I thought that would be the way to go. So I learned how to write some Visual Basic because I had to pull in data from a bunch of different sources and combine it and display it in my Excel spreadsheet. And ultimately, it got the job done. And I had some fun doing it because it was something new that I hadn't done before. And I felt pretty clever to have figured it all out. So I had a final product that met my team's needs. But when I tried to share the code behind it with other people, they were not quite so happy because they're not Visual Basic programmers, believe it or not. And I had also written the code in a way that was somewhat specific to my team. So I had a choice to make. I could keep this as a more localized story that worked for my team and that I was the master of, 
Or I could expand it out, bring in some co-authors, make it have a broader audience appeal. So I chose that second option. I got together with a small team of coworkers and we rewrote the whole thing in AngularJS. Oh, there's some fans of AngularJS in the audience, yay. And I do mean AngularJS, not Angular, unfortunately. If you know the distinction, you'll understand. <laughs> so we wrote this in a language, JavaScript, using a framework, AngularJS, that more people at my company could understand. They could read the code and see what was going on. And I made the code more general as well so that other people could read it without having to know specifics about my team. And then as an added bonus, the final product was then available out on the web so that anyone could see the final application. And then to make the code itself more available as well, we published it on our company's internal open source repository in GitLab. So now anyone at my company can go and find this code, they can see what it's doing, they can offer suggestions for improvement or even submit pull requests to improve it themselves. And I've learned through this experience and through many other experiences I've had that I am not that same developer I was eight years ago when I started my job. I might still have this tendency to write clever code to do ridiculous things like go out and teach myself Visual Basic so I can write a spreadsheet application. But my goal now is to write code that is compelling for my community, to tell a compelling story through that code. Because I found that our community, like each of us, is neither constant nor undefined. We have a well-defined, awesome JavaScript community here in Omaha and around the world Yet our community is mutable, and it can be made more awesome. You can make it more awesome by sharing your story with that community. Who are you? You are a member of this vibrant community of fellow developers who want to help you tell your story, who want to help make your story more interesting and compelling. So I challenge you to find other developers who will help you in that task people who will collaborate with you and give you feedback, people with whom you can learn and grow together. Perhaps the lunch break after this might be a great opportunity to get that started. So share the story of your code with this wonderful community because the real power for your story is found when you let the story of your code become the story of our code. <laughs>